the nightly business report. Good evening. Tonight, cabinet decisions made on appointing new chiefs department of registrations of persons and Indian Revenue Service and bids have been called for the procurement of the Merchant Bank of Sri Lanka. Data published by the Central Bank shows Sri Lanka's tax revenue grew 43% to 2156 billion rupees in the 7 months to July 2024. and the overall budget deficit fell steeply by 41% to 1470 billion rupees the gains that kicked off the week at the csc continue to grow as both the aspi and the snp sl20 end in the green the aspi keeps its numbers above 12000 and us stock indexes closed lower while treasury yields rose as traders reduced belts on federal reserve interest rates easing from studio 24 here sanuvi mudanayaka Good evening and thank you for joining us. At the cabinet press briefing held earlier today, Sri Lanka has appointed new chiefs for its Department for Registration of Persons and Inland Revenue Service. Also discussed was the awarding of the procurement for supplying establishment, assignment and maintenance of the Merchant Bank of Sri Lanka and Finance PLC. MSP Surya Peruma, an administrative service special grade officer, was appointed Commissioner General of the Department of Registration of Persons. UDN Chaivira, a special grade officer of the Indian Revenue Service, was appointed as the Commissioner General of the Excise Department. The Sri Lanka Excise Department is one of the main revenue collection agencies of the government. Bids have been called for the procurement for supplying, establishment, assignment, and maintenance of the Merchant Bank of Sri Lanka and Finance PLC of Co Banking Solution following the national competitive bidding procedure. Four institutions have submitted their bids. It has been recommended to award the respective procurement to Scientia Technologies Private Limited by the Technical Evaluation Committee and the Standing Procurement Committee appointed by the Cabinet of Ministers after the appraisal of technical proposals and financial proposals. Accordingly, the Cabinet of Ministers has approved the proposal presented by His Excellency the President to award the said procurement. Meanwhile, Foreign Minister Vijay Herat said Sri Lanka will review a wind power plant promoted by India's Adani Group after elections as no politicians will be taken on projects in the transition period. He stated that Sri Lanka will need to carefully examine both the advantages and disadvantages of the agreement, particularly highlighting that a key concern is the high unit price of electricity which poses a significant challenge. During a post cabinet press briefing minister Herat emphasized that no final decision would be made during the current interim period. He explained that any decision regarding the agreement would have to wait until a new government is in place as they need to consider several important factors. These include information provided by the Public Utilities Commission, an ongoing court case, and input from officials within the CEB. Furthermore, Sri Lanka had engaged in discussions about strengthening its economic ties with India during a visit by the External Affairs Minister S Jay Shankar. However these discussions did not focus on specific projects but rather on broadening the economic relationship between the two countries. Data published by the Central Bank shows Sri Lanka's tax revenue grew 43% to 2156 billion rupees in the 7 months July 2024 and the overall budget deficit fell steeply by 41% to 1470 billion rupees. Tax revenues grew 43% to 2156 billion rupees amid higher rates and also a pickup in economic growth made possible by monetary stability provided by the central bank by undershooting its high 5% inflation target. Non-tax revenues grew 30% to 151.3 billion rupees. Tax revenues showed a gain from 5 of gross domestic product last year to 6.3% of projected GDP this year. In the 7 months and total revenues went up to 6.9% of GDP from 5.5%. The IMF is pushing Sri Lanka to take its revenue to GDP ratio to around 15%. Meanwhile, current expenditure was kept in check at 2673 billion rupees up to July 2024, flat from 2674.8 billion rupees in an unusual phenomenon held by the monetary stability. Interest cost fell absolutely to 1392 billion rupees from 1498 billion rupees last year as treasury bill and bond yields fell. Sri Lanka has also restructured central bank and pension fund debt which pay 12%. Market rates have now fallen to the same or lower levels. 
Senior Professor Harindra Disa Bandara has been appointed as the new Chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission of Sri Lanka. He had previously served as SAC Director General from 2012 to 2013, as well as its Director of Financial Services, Academy and Capital Market Education and Training Division from 2008 to 2012. Disa Bandara is a Senior Professor of Finance and Corporate Governance in the Department of Finance of the Faculty of Management Studies and Commerce at the University of Sri Javadanapura. He obtained his BSc in Management Special Degree from the University of Sri Javadanapura in 1993 and MSc in Management from the same university in 2000. He obtained his PhD in Finance from Japan under the prestigious Monbosho Scholarship in 2006. Professor Disa Bandara takes over the reins from Faisal Zali, who had been appointed to the top post in the Capital Market Regulatory Body in February 2023 by the then President Ranil Vikramasinghe. The Hambantota International Port has marked a 40% increase in RORO vehicles handled between the second and third quarters of 2024. From 125,526 units handled in the second quarter, the port went up to 175,583 RORO units handled as at the end of September. A contributing factor to this is the increase in shipping lines operating from HIP for transshipment as well as the number of new ports joining the port's delivery network. Some of the new ports of loading in the portfolio include Shanghai, Ulsan, Taichung, Pyeongchang, Dafeng and Baltimore. The increase in RORO numbers envisaged and planned two years ago promoted HIP to expand its yard space. The Hambantor International Port Group's general manager, commercial and marketing, Lan So, says most of their RORO cargo is transshipped to different destinations worldwide. He adds that the port has also seen change in types of vehicles that arrive for transshipment adding that while there are several factors connected to the increase of RORO numbers, such as ports location and yard space, the key factor is service excellence and experienced handling, with the zero tolerance for accidents, having trained and experienced operational staff for vessel planning and cargo operation with facilities the smooth discharge of vehicles at their destination ports. Wilson Koo, CEO of the Hambantota Port Group, added that the Hambantota International Port Group is committed to enhancing the port service value with a clear focus on customer satisfaction. Let's take a short commercial break. Market updates on the other side. This is the Nightly Business Report. Welcome back to the Nightly Business Report. The gains that kicked off the week as the SCE continues to grow as both the ASPI and SNP SL20 end in the green. Meanwhile, the ASPI keeps its numbers about 12,000 points. For more on today's training sessions, we have with us Nagusan Balashira from Capital Alliance Securities. Yes, Sanavi. Today, the Kalamba Stock Exchange concluded on a positive note compared to the previous trading sessions due to overall positive sentiment among the participants. The market ended at 12,171 points, marking a 7-point increase from the previous session, with a turnover of 1.4 billion rupees. The SL20 index also experienced an upward movement of 14.5 points to end the day at 3,605 points. Notable institutional engagement was observed across various sectors with high turnovers recorded on Commercial Bank, Hades and John Keats Holdings. The top five gainers for the day were SMB Leasing Non-Voting, Nation Naka Finance, Industrial Asphalt, Dialogue Finance, and Muller and OIPS. The top five losers for the day were Blue Diamonds Non-Voting, UB Finance, Serendip Naka PLC, Citizens Development Bank, and Colombo City Holdings PLC. Private sector credit data is seeing an increase for the month of August and lending rates are also fluctuating owing to a hopeful economic outlook. For more details, we have Itad Zaima Jihan from First Capital Holdings. Uh, private sector credit saw a substantial jump in August 2024, amounting to 135.1 billion rupees. So this season over double the growth that was seen in July and is an indication of higher business activities and the election campaigns that took place in August. Uh, so this also reflects uh, the expansion in lending activities from the side of banks following a cautious stance that has been adopted earlier. So with this, uh, the total credit to private sector stood at uh, 7.7 trillion rupees as of August, 
uh, which is a year to date increase of about uh, 4.6%. Uh, so our expectations for private sector credit is uh, estimated to be at 7.5% for 2024, uh, which should typically be an increase of about 552 billion rupees. Uh, so nearly 60% of this has been already achieved and as this uh, low interest regime persists, we are likely to see more appetite for credit. In line with the improving demand for credit, AWPLR2 has been on a decline. Uh, but with the uncertainty emerging amidst the elections, AWPLR saw some mild volatility over the last couple of months. However, now again it has begun to slow down as uh, bond market saw some stability following the agreement that was reached on the EDR and the completion of the presidential election. Uh, so with this, AWPR as at week ending 4th October uh, witnessed a decline of 19 basis points to 9.13% uh, for the second consecutive week. Gold prices were little changed today as market participants awaited the minutes of the latest Federal Reserve policy meeting and economic data for insights on the U.S. interest rate path. Spot gold was flat at $2,639.45 per ounce. U.S. gold futures dropped 0.2% to $2,661.80. Bullion is considered a safe investment during times of political uncertainty. Investors are focused on the minutes of the Fed's latest policy meeting due tomorrow, followed by U.S. Consumer Price Index on Thursday and the Producer Price Index data on Friday. Several Fed officials are also lined up to speak throughout the week. Oil prices fell more than $1 a barrel today as traders took profits from a rally in the previous sessions that lifted the market to its highest level in over a month on fears the Middle East could be on the brink of a region-wide war. Brent crude futures fell 1.6% to $79.62 per barrel. U.S. West Texas intermediate futures fell 1.7% to $75.85 a barrel. Both contracts rose more than 3% yesterday to their highest level since late August, adding to last week's rally of 8%, the biggest weekly gain in over a year, on concerns that escalating hostilities could disrupt oil supplies from the Middle East. Fighting in the region intensified after Iran-backed Hezbollah fired rockets as Israel's third largest city, Haifa, and Israel looked poised to expand its offensive into Lebanon, a year after the Hamas attack that sparked Israel's ongoing war in Gaza. The Sri Lankan rupee remains steady against the US dollar in commercial banks today compared to yesterday. According to the Commercial Bank, the buying rates of the US dollar have reduced from 288 rupees and 28 cents to 282 rupees, 87 pardon rupees and 52 cents, and selling rates from 298 rupees to 297 rupees and 25 cents. Now let's take a look at how the Sri Lankan rupee is performing against other global currencies. Let's take a short commercial break. This is the Nightly Business Report. Welcome back to the Nightly Business Report. Standard Chartered Priority, Sri Lanka has collaborated with Durden's Hospitals, a trusted name in Sri Lankan healthcare for over seven decades, to provide Standard Chartered Priority customers an enhanced and rewarding healthcare experience via the Durden's Priority Circle, an exclusive healthcare proposition. The Durden's Priority Circle was established with the goal of providing premium, tailored healthcare based on individual specifications. Currently, the Priority Circle offers end to end personalized services to all members with state-of-the-art facilities and competitive rates on many outpatient and inpatient services. The exclusive partnership launched recently at Durden's hospital premises in the presence of officials from both the parties ensures standard charter priority customers receive a one-of-a-kind exclusive service with significant savings up to 50% on health checkup packages, saving on all lab investigations, room charges, 
dental procedures and many more medical requirements. The partnership reflects the bank's pledge to delivering financial well-being while providing access to premium health care for its valued clients. Key features for standard chartered priority customers include health care tailored to individual specifications, ensuring that members receive an elevated standard of excellence in health care. This offers a unique service that manages health care needs with dedicated attention from start to finish. Standard chartered priority members also have entitlement to additional benefits such as courtyard parking, quick access to prescriptions, executive lounge facilities and priority scheduling with top specialists for fast and high quality care. Sunshine Healthcare Lanka Limited, the healthcare arm of diversified conglomerate Sunshine Holdings PLC, announced a successful conclusion of the approximately 3,270 million rupee equity investment from the International Finance Corporation, a member of the World Bank Group. This landmark investment strengthens SHL's vision to expand healthcare accessibility and bolster innovation across the country. This investment marks a significant milestone in Sri Lanka's growth narrative as one of the notable foreign direct equity investments since the economic crisis signaled in the country's renewed stability and resilience. Private investments like this will be instrumental in driving Sri Lanka's economic transformation, demonstrating its readiness as a nation for a broad economic recovery. Following the successful completion of this transaction, IFC now holds a 14.73 equity stake in SHL. This strategic partnership will enable SHL to accelerate the execution of key capital projects that aim to reshape healthcare delivery in the country including significant expansions in manufacturing and medical devices. SHL is set to significantly expand its pharmaceutical manufacturing capability by doubling its capacity in respiratory products. In parallel, SHL will enhance diagnostic capabilities by investing in state-of-the-art medical devices, providing better access to cutting-edge healthcare technology with enhanced efficiency and productivity. Group Chief Executive Officer Shyam Satasivam said that this partnership strengthens Sunshine's role in enhancing healthcare accessibility and contributes to the country's economic resilience at a critical time. With IFC's support, they are significantly ramping up local pharmaceutical manufacturing and bolstering their healthcare infrastructure, ensuring all Sri Lankans have access to high-quality, locally produced pharmaceuticals and innovative healthcare solutions. The AAT Sri Lanka 2024 conference themed Rise to Conquer took place recently at Water's Edge Hotel, bringing together business leaders, professionals and industry experts. The event centred on critical themes such as resilience, innovation, collaboration and empowerment, aiming to inspire participants to navigate the challenges of the modern business world. Founded in 1987, AAT Sri Lanka has been a leading educational institution dedicated to providing mid-level accounting professionals who contribute significantly to country's economic and business landscape. This year's conference further reinforced their mission by providing a platform for industry leaders to share their insights and strategies. The conference featured a distinguished lineup of participants, including prominent business figures and entrepreneurs. The Honorable Secretary to the Prime Minister, Mr. G. Pradeep Sambotantri, attended as the chief guest, while Dr. Kishu Gomez, Grouping Manager, Director, CEO of Exterminators PLC, delivered the keynote address. During the event, speakers and panelists share knowledge on strategies and solutions that would empower professionals to contribute to Sri Lanka's economic recovery and growth. The emphasis was on preparing individuals to face the evolving challenges of the business world while fostering a culture of collaboration and innovation. AAT Sri Lanka Chairman Mr. Indra Kalyanagi emphasized that the primary objective of the event was to equip professionals with the knowledge and tools needed to thrive in a competitive and changing global business environment. He further added that such initiatives are essential for driving the country's economic development and ensuring that professionals are ready to take on leadership roles in the future. Uninotes.lk, which was launched this year, has emerged as a revolutionary platform, enabling Sri Lankan students to find the right course that suits them among universities in Sri Lanka. This innovative platform connects prospective students with both local and globally recognized universities in Sri Lanka, offering a range of courses and qualification types. The platform has been created to improve the experience for students by allowing them to select their preferred courses using different filtering options. This ensures that students can find courses that perfectly match their academic goals and career plans. The user-friendly interface makes it easier for students to enter their preferences and begin searching. With seconds, with minimal effort, they can browse through over 1,000 courses and send inquiries directly to the university through the platform, saving both time and effort. Uninotes.lk also offers a diverse selection of courses across various disciplines, partnering with globally recognized universities in the country. From certificate-level programs to PhDs, 
The platform caters to a wide array of academic interests and career paths, broadening the education opportunities available to students. In addition to connecting prospects with courses, UDNotes.LK has also partnered with universities to offer scholarships to provide financial assistance to deserving students, making higher education more accessible and affordable. By providing a centralized platform with extensive course offerings, UDNotes.LK has made higher education more accessible to students across the island and beyond. Siapa the Finance PLC was honoured as the Best Employer Brand at the recently concluded Sri Lanka Best Employer Brand Awards 2024, organised by the Employer Branding Institute India, alongside with the World Congr Charity Congress and stars of the Industry Awards Group. The awards recognise and reward Sri Lankan brands that excel in human resources and its development. The certification is provided by World Federation of HR Professionals, an independent, not-for-profit network pledged to effectively promote the interests of HR professionals and senior leaders worldwide. Commenting on this prestigious achievement, the Finance PLC Chief Human Resources Officer Mr. Prasad Durugampala shared that this certification is deeply valuable to them as an employer and goes far beyond the achievement of an award, adding that they are truly honoured to receive this award as one team and believe it sets the motion to continue these best practices in the future. Endorsed by CHRO Asia, a global platform that promotes knowledge sharing and progression by convening HR leaders across industries, the Best Employer Brand Award 2024 is a testament to CFPTA's commitment to create an exceptional workplace while fostering a positive employee experience. CFPTA Finance PLC, the largest fully owned subsidiary of Sampath Bank Group, boasts an island wide network of branches, ensuring its customers are provided with the best in service delivery standards. Over the past 19 years, the company has contributed to the development of the small and medium entrepreneurial efforts as well as the fulfilment of individual financial needs across the island. Going in for a short commercial break, right now we'll be back with global updates. This is the Nightly Business Report. Welcome back to the Nightly Business Report. Most Asian markets fell today, tracking overnight weakness in Wall Street as strength in the US job market drove bets that interest rates will remain relatively high. Chinese markets vastly outperformed their peers, rising sharply as trade resumed after a week and as investors reacted to a barrage of stimulus measures from Beijing. Other Asian markets took a weak lead in from Wall Street, which fell sharply as traders priced in the prospect of a smaller rate cut in November. US stock index futures were muted in Asian trade. Trade resumed after the Golden Week holiday with investors buying into Chinese markets after Beijing announced a slew of major stimulus measures to boost economic growth. U.S. stock indexes closed lower while Treasury yields rose as traders reduced bets on Federal Reserve interest rates easing and worried about the impact of the Middle East conflict on oil. U.S. stocks closed lower Monday while Treasury yields rose as traders lowered bets for another half a percentage point interest rate cut from the Federal Reserve. Meanwhile, worries over an escalation of the conflict in the Middle East also weighed on markets. The Dow and S&P 500 dropped nearly 1% each, while the tech-heavy Nasdaq fell a little more than that. Further dampening sentiment was Google parent Alphabet, whose shares slipped more than 2% after a U.S. judge ordered the tech giant to overhaul its mobile app business to give Android phone users more options. And Amazon stock declined 3% after Wells Fargo cut its rating to equal weight from overweight. Goldman Sachs also is positive on the market. The investment bank raised its 2024 year-end S&P 500 target to 6,000 from 5,600 and lowered its odds of a U.S. recession to 15% from 20%. One other stock move of note, Pfizer, which added 2% after a report that activist investor Starboard Value has taken a roughly $1 billion stake in the drug maker. Tokyo Metro aims for an IPO price of 1,100 to 1,200 yen per share, potentially raising as much as $2.35 billion. The final price will be set on the 15th of October ahead of its listing on the Tokyo Stock Exchange on the 23rd of October. The Tokyo Metro is set to do Japan's biggest share listing in six years. 
The Urban Railway Network on Monday priced its IPO offering at up to 1,200 yen per share, or about $8. That was slightly up on earlier estimates and means the metro could raise over $2.3 billion. A final price for the subway system, which is owned by city and national governments, will be set later in the month. The metro dates back to 1920, when it was established as the Tokyo Underground Railway Company. Seven years later, it opened Japan's first subway line, connecting areas on the north side of the city centre. Now investors will be assessing the timing for the IPO. Japanese stocks suffered an historic rout in early August, sparked by a surprise interest rate hike and fears over the US economy. However, shares have since recovered strongly, and the benchmark Nikkei index is up around 18% this year. Also heading for an IPO is Japanese X-ray technology firm Rigaku. Together, the two listings would more than double the value of IPOs in Japan so far this year. The country's government says it will use money raised in the metro sale to repay bonds issued after the 2011 earthquake and tsunami. And that's all from us here at the Nightly Business Report. Join us again tomorrow for more key updates across the business globe. I am Sani Mudan Nayaka. Thank you for watching. Good night.